So the last couple of weeks we talked about what? What was our topic? Joseph. <laughs> wow. There you go. <laughs> she turned her, she cheated. <laughs> so yeah, we talked about Joseph's great forgiveness of his brothers and God's great forgiveness towards us and then how we should forgive others, which we talked a lot about last week. So this week, we're going to talk about the blessings of fatness. Topic dear to my heart. <laughs> have some candy, ladies. Have some candies. It's okay tonight. <laughs> but anyway, we're going to talk about the blessings that come with reconciliation because that's what Joseph did. He reconciled with his brothers. The forgiveness took place. And there are, there are blessings when we reconcile with, with others and with God. So we're talking a little bit about that tonight. So we'll begin in Genesis 45, 9. It says, Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. So he's given an order to his brothers to head home and go get dad. So Joseph proclaiming he is Lord of all foreshadows Jesus being Lord of all. He really had quite a power position if he could proclaim that, didn't he? I am Lord of all in Egypt. He, he really truly felt like he was almost Pharaoh himself, didn't he? But aren't we glad Jesus is Lord of all? Oh, so good, especially when you compare it to other things. You really, no comparison. So we read about Jesus being Lord of all in places like Matthew 28, 18. What? It's, yeah, it's at 78. You can go turn it up or whatever. You want me to do it or do you want to do it? We can turn it up or down or around. I'm, I'm a little cold, but that's me. I'm... You, just turn up one degree and shut it. It'll shut down for a while. Careful though. I'm surprised it's popping on, but sometimes that'll help. It'll go off for a little bit. So we read about Jesus being Lord of all in places like Matthew 28:18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He's Lord of everything, right? God gave him that authority, God the Father. And then Philippians 2, 9 through 11, Therefore God also has highly exalted him, and that's in reference to Jesus, right? And given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. That's everywhere, right? And, of the, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Revelation 19, 6, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. And that's in reference to Jesus reigning in, uh, when he comes back. So... I'm glad he's Lord of all. I can't wait till he comes back and reigns and there's a peaceful government being ruled rightly on the earth. But also in um, Genesis 45, 9, we read another thing. Uh, he is declaring his, um, or asking his brothers, well, let's see, where is it at? Hurry up and go down, whoop, hey. Hurry up and go down to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not tarry. Hey, I think there's a verse missing. It's a, a, a duplicate of the first. Yeah. It was supposed to be that plus one more. And I think that there's a typo. Anyway. Oh, I know what it is. Okay, sorry. I'm a little, I'm a little tired. <laughs> My, my brain's a little out of focus. Um, 
Joseph foreshadows Jesus as the one who calls his people to declare his lordship and glory to the world. He's telling his, his brothers to go down to find his father and let him know that he's lord of all. Declare my glory, declare what I'm doing, who I am. So that's just what Jesus did. He asked his own people, God the Father asked the people of Israel to declare his glory to all the nations to let people know. And we read about that in places like Isaiah 66, 18 through 21. For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall be that I will gather all nations and tongues and they shall come to see my glory. And I will set a sign among them, and those among them who escape I will send to the nations, to Tarshish, and Pool, and Lud, and draw the bow, and Tubal, and Javan, all these names, to the coastlands afar off who have not heard my fame, nor seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Then they shall bring all your brethren for an offering to the Lord out of all the nations, on horses, and in chariots, and in litter, lit, litters. <laughs> on mules and on camels to my holy mountain Jerusalem says the Lord as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord and I will also take some of them for priests and Levites says the Lord so there's going to come a time where Israel is going to be declaring the Lord's glory to all the nations and then all the nations are going to come and worship the Lord they were given the command Israel was given a command back in Exodus 19:6 and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. They were commanded back then by God when they first left Egypt that they were supposed to go tell the nations about God. They were supposed to be witnesses to the nations around them. But unfortunately, they got off track right off the bat and they did not witness. Instead of leading people, the other nations, away from their false idols and gods, they ended up worshiping those false idols and God and left their true God behind. And they forsook their call. So the Israelites forsook their call to be priests and a holy nation who would lead men to God. That was what their purpose was. They had a call. But we as Christians have been given that same call, right? The call went out again to us when Jesus came. And when he left the earth, Acts 1.8, he said, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. We've been given the same assignment the Israelites were given. We've been called to go out and witness to the entire world just like they were supposed to be doing. And then in 1 Peter 2.9, it also says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. This is the same calling, basically, that the Israelites have. <coughs> His own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We're supposed to be telling others what he's done for us. He's taken us out of the darkness. We're not supposed to join them in the darkness and stay there. That's what the Israelites did. So as Christians, we are to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation proclaiming the praises of God in a world of darkness. So I missed uh, 50 of uh, a bazillion likes there. What was I doing? <laughs> Where were you at? Okay. Have you got this one? Oh my gosh, you got all that? Where was all that you doing? <laughs> you got to have more. Looking more. Your Bible. Oh, that, what do you think this is? <laughs> she's, she's reading past where we're at is what's happening, huh? She's per, pursue, per, perusing the stuff. <laughs> but, you know, even though the Israelites have walked away from what they were called to do in general, I mean, there's some Messianic Jews now that are fulfilling the call. They've come to know the Lord and they're witnessing, witnessing to their people, witnessing to us Gentiles as well. But thankfully, at a certain point, they will come back and, and take up the call again. And we read about them in Revelation, Revelation 7, 4, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. So there were 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes when the tribulation time period 
begins, they're going to come to, to, to witness around the world for the Lord. So the Jews will get back on track, and they're going to reach a lot of people as a result. Revelation 7, 9 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and with palm branches in her hand. And this is what's going to, this is sort of a, because what happens during a tribulation, these, these 144,000 Jews are going to roam the earth witnessing. They're going to reach a whole lot of people. And what happens in the tribulation period? Because of their faith, most of them are going to get killed. So there's going to be a whole bunch of them in heaven right away, praising God and worshiping. That's what this verse is about. So a blessing the Israelites are going to get back to work. I mean, they're doing a little bit of it now. But at that point, when the tribulation comes, they're going to be working hard at it, witnessing. Revelation 14.4 says, After these things I looked... And behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Hey, why does that look like the same verse? <laughs> oh, wow. Interesting. <laughs> I just love how things happen. Well, it was another verse about, <laughs> about what goes on. Somebody got their Bible and can look it up. 14.4. For those of you, Revelation is the last book of the Bible. <laughs> That's heavy, she knows. <laughs> we just, I thought you'd get that because we were doing sword drill. I know. On These are those who did not defile themselves with women, but they oh. kept themselves pure. They followed the Lamb wherever He goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No, no lie was found in their mouths. So that's another verse in reference to the 144,000 witness. Blameless men that don't know women, they're solely dedicated to witnessing for God during that time period. It's a great thing that they finally come back to, to fulfilling their call for the Lord. Um, so they're going to be protected is what you also learn in that verse. I believe it's that one where it said... Uh, you know, because they're, they're basically roaming the earth and Antichrist's forces are out and about, and yet they're going to all miraculously survive. God's going to protect them as they go out witnessing. He's going to keep his little army of men moving and protect them. I thought you just said that 12,000 will be killed. That's why they're witnesses in heaven. No. I'm saying the, tw the, the 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe, they're going to do a lot of major witnessing. There's going to be multitudes that are going to come to know the Lord from all over the world. But because it's the tribulation period, the Antichrist is going to kill most of them. Most of the people who The people who receive Christ. Oh, I missed... Yeah. Oh, see, I, I, misheard I, I, that. I misheard that too. Sorry, I must have ran my sentences I together. I was no, they're going to all miraculously live. They're going to keep witnessing. They're, God's going to protect them. That's why the seal is on them. They're protected. That's what that means. So Antichrist can't get to them. They're just going to keep roaming the earth and witnessing. I still have... Because <laughs> I, I watched all those Thief in the Night movies and stuff, you know, the old 70s tribulation series. You know, the, they put out like four movies back then. And I still remember those hippie light guys. <laughs> Uh, Roman the earth, they showed those guys just walking through the meadows, witnessing to people. <laughs> it was, that image is still stuck in my head after all these years. Anyway, so a great multitude that can't be counted from every nation, tribe, people, and language will come to faith in Christ due to the 144,000 Israelites declaring God's glory. I think that's your big fill-in-the-blank one for tonight. <laughs> okay, so let's read on. Genesis 45, 9 through 13. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near to me, and you and your children, your children's children, your flocks and your herds, and all that you have. That's quite a bunch of people to pack up. 
There I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty, for there are still five years of famine. And behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You know, you must, you know I wonder if they were in shock because he told them, a, a, like it's a fact, there's five more years of famine. You know, you must have to wonder, how do you know that, Joseph? So you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and all that you have seen, and you shall hurry and bring my father down here. So if you notice in, let's see, verse 9, he says, Come down to me and be near to me in verse 10. It's a wonderful inf invitation he's giving them and a reminder of how Joseph foreshadows Jesus' invitation for us to be near him and be sustained by him. He's, mm -hmm. Joseph is calling them to come near, save your lives, be sustained, be provided for. There's five years of famine. Jesus does the same thing for us. We have to come near, and he'll sustain us. He'll take care of us. So... Do you have the total number of the shadows between... There were a hundred, um, is what uh, some commentators say. Um, I have done almost all of those, so we didn't quite do every one of them but yeah that's a lot that's why they say it's a more he's a more complete foreshadowing of of jesus because there's so much that is like jesus's life you know and who he was so um so so uh sometimes we're in the middle of a famine-like crisis or life that we're going through, whether it's spiritual, sometimes we enter a spiritual famine in our life, and sometimes it's a physical or an emotional famine. Um, but God calls us to come near to Him when we're going through those times, and He'll take care of us. It's important to remember you're not alone. He'll call us. He wants us to be near. He wants to take care of us. So we need to seek Him during those famine-like times through prayer. Oh, typo. Through prayer and cast our burdens on him then wait and watch him sustain us as a result but those times are important or we wouldn't do it mm -hmm. you get both connie mm -hmm. you're so good you could be a secretary so Remember, we remember verse uh, Psalm 55, 22, cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. He will sustain us and will not permit us to be moved. But the key is what? To come near, to be near him, to be close to him. You can't be sustained if you're busy walking your own path, trying to do your own thing, trying to fix your own problems without God. You need Him. So this is where your homework comes in. We've talked about some of these verses before. Some of them are our favorite verses that we all enjoy. You know, when you get time, look them up. And uh, Susan's going to start memorizing them. <laughs> There you go. I studied for like a week. Oh, okay. I'll get you coming coming there. Not that Debbie does. So I only picked out one for us to read here tonight. Um, Psalm seventy three twenty six. My mind and my body. I put it in the Good News translation. My mind and my body may grow weak, and that's sad. But God is my strength. He is all I ever need. Amen. All we ever need. I thought that was a, a nice translation. So if you take these verses and memorize a few of them even, when you're having a famine situation in your life, you're feeling down or discouraged or need some spiritual uplift, these verses help, help you get through sometimes when, you're, when you read them, think about them. So let's read on. That was, that was the good Translation. That's a fifth grade level, so if you feel like you're not up to reading par... <laughs> 
sometimes I, you know, that's a good one when you're teaching kids, you know, because it's younger. This is also the 70s version, very apropos, because good news. So we can call it with that. Uh-huh. Also, I had that in my hand at all times, I'm telling you, kept me going. They gave me a good news translation, because brand new back then when I was uh, in VBS, I think it was. So, yeah. Is it yeah. still mine? Yeah, I oh, sell yeah. mine too. So you can get it on your U version. It's on U version. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, everything's on U version. Almost everything. I didn't like it because somebody. I liked it till I got in an argument with my pastor over a verse, and then they told me it was not verse by verse. So be, it's not word by word. It's not verse by verse. It's like it's. it's uh, Paraphrase? Yeah, I don't, it's not a paraphrase. I don't think it's no. a paraphrase. I think it's a translation. Translation. But it's fifth grade reading level, so that can really vary how you're... Yeah, I was reading that when I was going to college. So I was reading way above myself. <laughs> Give me something simple. Simple. Something simple, and that's why... And they didn't have new, new King James. <laughs> right. You, yeah, you only had King James back in the 70s, so... And, mm -hmm. and uh, so many words... The one I'm reading now is the uh, Old King James because it's the only thing that would come up on my tablet. And it is, a, luckily, you can poke on it and get a translation for the, the oddest words because oh. it's old English. Yeah. It's so old English you can't even, it's not that these and now's the kids, it's the old English words for for moving or for anything. I mean, I've had to look up more words than I didn't know I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a language lesson, huh? Yeah. So, um, let's read on 14 and 15 in Genesis. Uh, then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them, and after that his brothers talked with him. The repentance, forgiveness, and reconciliation of Joseph and his brothers bringing, bring, is, there's a word missing. I fixed these. What happened to all my stuff? <laughs> his brothers bringing sweet fellowship foreshadows the same for us with Jesus. I wonder if I didn't save after I corrected everything. <laughs> What's wrong? It's bringing, it's okay. bringing there's, sweet it's, it seems like it's not right, but anyway, could be my fatigue, but... Uh, that's what when you reconcile with someone and you, you're able to just enjoy each other again I mean 22 years these brothers have been apart and they didn't part on a good they weren't on good terms back then and now it's like a whole different relationship and they're enjoying one another's sad because there's just a lot of them not, not a bad sad but just a lot of emotions uh, they're sharing tears with each other. Um, can, I just can't. I just think about that when you when you know you've done something wrong to someone and you you feel so bad, but yet you're so happy because you're reunited. You're working it out. There's, I guess, tears of joy you might say. But uh, what a sweet fellowship they're having now together. Something they've never had, uh, and that's. That's what it is like with us. You, you know, when you sin and your fellowship breaks with God, you feel distant from God. Um, there no, there's not a closeness. You've, you've been avoiding God, so to speak. Um, when you finally repent, do you know how that feels? You, you, you're kind of upset with yourself, but yet you're so happy that you feel like you're hearing from God again. You're you're back in that relationship again, and, and it's the same thing for us. We get to experience that sweet fellowship with God when we reconcile with him when we've sinned and we seek his forgiveness. First John 1, 5 through 7 um, talks about um, how we have fellowship with God or with others. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. 
and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So to truly have fellowship with God or others, we have to be walking right. We have to be not habitually sinning, living that sinful lifestyle, living in darkness. We have to be living in the light and truth. So as Christians, to be able to fellowship with God and others, we are to no longer live in sin and darkness, but instead live in the light and truth of God. And isn't that pretty much what's happened with these boys? They've been kind of hiding in their sin and darkness all this time. Couldn't have fellowship with Joseph. Now the truth is out. The light has shined and shined, shone, and they're reunited. Got it? So Genesis 45, 16 through 24. Now the report of it was heard in Pharaoh's house saying, Joseph's brothers have come. So it pleased Pharaoh and his servants well. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, say to your brothers, do this, load your animals and depart. Go to the land of Canaan. Bring your father and your households and come to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you will eat the fat of the land. Now you are commanded, do this. Take carts out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives and bring your father and come. Also do not be concerned about your goods for the best of the land of Egypt is yours. Then the sons of Israel did so and Joseph gave them carts according to the command of Pharaoh and he gave them provisions for the journey. He gave to all of them, to each man, changes of garments, but to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garment. And he sent to his father these things, ten donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt and ten female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and food for his father for the journey. So he sent his brothers away and they departed and he said to them, see that you do not become troubled along the way. So, um, Throughout the study, during this time in Egypt, we've seen um, Pharaoh sort of in the light of a God, like God the Father, on several occasions as a foreshadowing, not a foreshadowing, but a typology of him. And Joseph, of course, as we've been studying, he's Jesus. He represents Jesus. So you have God the Father and Jesus. Now, Israel, most of this time, um, Jacob and his, his boys, have represented Israel, a foreshadowing of Israel and what they would go through, as well as we see us in them, you know, what, what they're going through and what they experience are the same things we do. So with thinking about that in mind, you have to realize that uh, because of Jacob and his family's relationship with Joseph, Pharaoh now lavishly uh, provides for Joseph and his family, his family, Jacob and his family. He blesses them because of their relationship to Joseph. So because of our relationship to Jesus, God the Father lavishly blesses us. It's a foreshadowing of what we experience, right? So when he says in verse 18... Bring your father and your households and come to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you will eat of the fat of the land. In some translations, it's the fatness of the land. It just depends on where you're reading. Um, this unique expression was only used once right here in the Bible. Never mentioned anywhere else. This is the only place where it's talked about. And it's, it's a reference to the richness of the land, yes. The, the blessings of the land they're going to be moving into, the, what's going to be provided for them. But it's also, one of the Jewish commentators talked about it also, also being a reference to the oils of the land, the fat of the land, because oil is, a, is a, seen as a blessing in the Bible. It's, it's beneficial, um, and, in their, and to them, and in their lifestyle, it's a, a, a blessing to have oil. Um, so there'd be benefits from the oils of the land as well. So the fats of the land, or the oils were valued in the Bible and if you read through the Bible they're equated with spiritual blessing, anointing,
calling or healing. So this weird little phrase that's in this verse is a indication of the spiritual blessings that they're going to experience. A little fat, a little oil does the body good. There's a proverb, I can't remember, I should have looked that one up. I always cling to that one because then I say, oh, I can eat that fried chicken. It'll do me a little good. <laughs> Maybe not, but yeah. So some of the places you find some of these verses is Psalm 23, 5, which we studied, right? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. And we talked about how the shepherd uses the oil on the sheep's head, his ears, and his nose to protect him from the pests of life. It's it's healing. It's helpful to the sheep. And then when some. Diana was a baby. She was allergic to all those ointments for diaper rash. Uh huh. And I was putting olive oil. Oh, and olive oil. And it was so good. So Soothed her. In a couple of days, she was the skin was healed. Oh, wow. Cool. And then when she grew a little, and I was pouring olive oil on the salad. Oh, <laughs> that's more like that. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, poor little thing. <laughs> Psalm 45 7. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. So the blessing of gladness is, is poured on him. Proverbs 21 20. There is desirable treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise. See that tie? It's a treasure, and it's tied to the wisdom as well. But a foolish man squanders it. Their oil is very valued. James 5.14, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And a lot of our churches don't practice this anymore. There's some that do. When I was a sweet young thing at the age of 20 a few years ago because uh, I'm like 23 now <laughs> I I was really <laughs> I'm just testing I'm just testing you I'm trying to make sure you're awake um, I was pretty I was pretty sick at that nice young age and I was doubled over in pain and what it was was I was having ulcers at 20 <laughs> And I, I couldn't even focus to go to school. I was in so much pain. I was pretty much on the couch for there for a while. I couldn't get to college. I was kind of messing up that one whole semester of college. And I remember my pastor and the, the deacons came over with oil and they prayed over me and, and, and put oil on me, anointed me with oil. And, and Terry's done that for a few people, you know, through the years that, that feel comfortable enough to have prayer that way. Mm hmm mm hmm that's right yeah and it there's it's 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 uh there's nothing wrong with it it's something that God says is okay so but some people aren't comfortable with that and it's it's a decision they have to make but I was I felt overwhelmed you know blessed that they would come and and do that for me and um it did get better eventually after that but so uh, God was able to provide for Jacob's family um, with the finest of the land of Egypt. I mean, what a blessing. He gave them the best, the best place to live for their herds and flocks. Even in the middle of scarcity, you know, this horrible famine, he's making sure their whole travel is even provided for, giving them comfortable carts and donkeys. Not that those are necessarily comfortable, but giving them all the goods they need for the whole journey. And then walking. Hmm? Better than walking. Better than walking, yeah. Yeah. And uh, given the best of the land, given the oils of the land, just totally set up. Um, and what he said, what I was going to say about Genesis 45, 20, is he makes a comment to them, do not be concerned about your goods. So the stuff, they have a lot of wealth, a lot of tents, and a lot of things back in Canaan, right? He's saying, you don't need to worry about your stuff. You're going to be lavishly provided for here in this new land of Egypt. And 
That's the same thing with us. We're not supposed to be concerned about our stuff, what we may have to give up or leave behind because of our relationship with Christ. You know, sometimes you have to leave family behind. Sometimes you have to give up friends. Sometimes you have to move and give up your hometown that you grew up in because God calls you someplace different. Um, maybe because you're following Christ and your family's not. You have to give up your family because that's what God's asking you to do. So, you know, we read about what Jesus said about that in um, Matthew 19, 29. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. So we're not to be concerned, just like Pharaoh and Joseph didn't want his family to be concerned about what they might give up to move there. You know, if they had to give up all their tents just to make it there, they had to give them up and move on. Um, it was okay. Pharaoh and Joseph were going to provide for their family. God does the same thing for us when we give up things to follow him. It may be hard. Your heart may ache. But he'll bless you in eternity for what you do. And he may bless you here on earth. There's no guarantee. Maybe he's going to give you new friends or somebody that's like family to replace what you've lost. Maybe he'll give you a new home that's just as good as what you had. But there's no guarantee of that. But you do know you'll be blessed in heaven. You'll be blessed for eternity. So that's where you have to keep your eyes focused forward no matter what you're going through here on earth. So anything we as Christians have to give up because we follow Christ, we'll receive a hundred times as much in rewards while we enjoy eternal life with him. I mean, that's the only thing you really need, just that blessing of eternal life and time with him. I mean, what a, we, we can't even imagine how good it's going to be. We, our minds can't even picture it. So in that passage we just read, you know, 16 through 24, um, it's a reminder that our relationship with Jesus allows God the Father to give us the blessings of fatness or abundance in our life. It's because of our acceptance of Jesus and what he did for us that God the Father is able to bless us. It's that connection, just like Jacob's family is connected to Joseph, that's what allowed Pharaoh to bless them. So we know some of these verses. We're familiar with some of that abundance and blessing. John 10.10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Your life is better even if you think you've lost some things. Your life is way better than with Jesus than without. It's a, it's a blessing. 2 Corinthians 1.20, For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen to the glory of God through us. We have all those promises we can read about in the Bible that we can cling to. 1 Timothy 6.17, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. He gives us everything we need to enjoy this life. And that even if that means you're living in a hut, he's still going to give you what you need to enjoy life with him. 2 Peter 1.3 As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. So our knowledge of him is what's going to give us what we need for everything in this life. The way to live. Sometimes you feel like you can't conquer some of your habits, your sins, your problems that you don't have the gifts you need to do what he's called you to do, but he's given us everything we need. That's where we have to come near, let him sustain us, let him work through us and provide for us and help us. So I just praise God for his abundant blessings of fatness <laughs> and provisions for us. So that's all I had for tonight. Thank you. You're welcome.